My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. And hello, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the David Summerfleck podcast. I'm your host. Today, my guest is Stephen Hawley Martin. Hopefully, I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Stephen is the host of a podcast, The Truth About Life. And while conducting the podcast, it became clear to uh, this best-selling author that as he interviewed dozens of near-death survivors and psychics and researchers into the paranormal, as well as quantum physicists and doctors, that humanity was on the cusp of a transition into a newer understanding of the true nature of reality. To share what he's learned and to help speed the transition, Stephen believes this will result in a rebirth of optimization, optimism excuse me, and the world becoming a better place to live and work. He's written well over a dozen books, many of which have achieved bestseller status on Amazon. Stephen is a former principal of the ad firm uh, that created the Geico Gecko, which is brilliant and the Virginia is for Lovers campaign, the Martin Agency, and he's currently the editor and publisher of the Oak Lee Press. He's the only three-time winner of the Writer's Digest Book Award, having won first prize twice for fiction and once for nonfiction, and has also won first prize for visionary fiction from independent publisher and first prize for nonfiction from the USA Book News. Is all that correct, Stephen? Well, yes, it is, David. Thank you so much for that uh, that introduction. That was very kind of you, and I'm I'm happy to be here. I'm looking forward to our chat. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I appreciate it. I think a lot of what you wrote about was really, really interesting, and I'm sure our viewers or listeners will think so as well. So unless you want to intervene, I'm just going to go ahead and get started with my questions. Let's go for it. Let's see what we'll see what you want to talk about. Okay. So number one, I'd like to start at the basics because we've spoken before to make sure that we, you know, we could do the podcast, but we don't really know each other that well. Can you tell me how did you get started writing and then eventually start Oakley Press and the Martin Agency? And I know I might have the chronology out of order. How did you basically get started? A lot of people have issues writing and just how did you get started on this trajectory? Yeah, well, you know, I just have always loved to write. I remember writing uh, probably my first uh, short story when I was in the eighth grade. And uh, uh, writing, of course, is a big part of the advertising business, which I've spent most of my career in. Uh, I started out right out of college. I went to work for a fairly large ad agency in Baltimore, Maryland. And my brother, older brother, had started a little firm called uh, Martin and Waltz uh, here in and after about six years working in Baltimore, I uh, got a call from him and he said they were open in a Washington, D.C. office. Did I want to run that? And uh, I thought about it, but I decided to do that. And so I joined my brother in, in that enterprise running the Washington, D.C. office. And a little while later, we bought out uh, his partner, Waltz, and it became the Martin Agency. And so my brother and I were partners in that business for about 25 years. 
And uh, of course, you know, you've mentioned the Geico Gecko and Virginia's for Lovers are two campaigns that probably people have heard of. And during that time, though, I was uh, I started probably almost th more than 30 years ago. I'd get up early in the morning and uh, say from six to seven, I would write a book. You know, I mm. had a, a novel. I had an idea for a novel. And that's how it started. And uh, I did that, uh, you know, if you write a couple of paragraphs or a couple of pages a day after about a year, you got a book. And I did. And, yeah. and that first book, uh, it did pretty well. And then I wrote another one. And uh, after a while, uh, it came time for me to uh, not retire, but we sold the Martin Agency to, uh, to a big uh, advertising holding company that's headquartered in England. And uh, so anyway, long story short, I was no longer in the advertising business. I made some money doing it and enjoyed it. But uh, I started the Oakley Press and I, I've been working at that for quite a number of years. We probably have over 50 books in print, including mine. And uh, that's how it all came about. But as far as how I got interested in this subject of the uh, nature of reality, I when I was still in Baltimore working there, I, I wasn't married yet. I had a couple of roommates and I got, got very sick with the flu. Mm. And well, I, when, when I was guess this? It, oh, uh, gosh. Probably when I was about 25. And uh, I, I got very sick and I, I don't know. Exact, don't know exactly how it happened, but it was like I was I, I was on the bed and I felt the room spinning, it seemed like. And all of a sudden, I just popped, my consciousness popped out of my body. And I was looking at myself from the ceiling, looking at my body, lying on the bed from the ceiling. And, I, and when that happened, you know, I, suddenly I felt fine. Now, but I was up. Now, I yeah. want to make sure that I understand this and anybody watching or listening understands this. So you had a really bad fever, right? Yeah, I had a bad fever. And, you know, what I think probably happened was that my blood pressure just really dropped for some reason. It just, and, and I just exited my body. And it didn't last very long. It probably, I'd say it lasted maybe, who knows, 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Yeah. But it was long enough for me to to look down and see myself and actually no longer feel any pain or, or uh, dizziness or anything that I was experiencing before. And I went, I guess the next thing I knew, I woke up the next morning and I felt a whole lot better than, than I had, you know, before that happened. But it started me thinking, how in the world can I be outside of my body, at least my consciousness, looking at my body, if my body, if my brain creates consciousness it's got to be inside my head where it has been all my life you know right. and uh, so that started me on a quest to find that out because i was i was raised in a scientifically minded family they were what i would call nowadays uh, scientific materialists they believe that uh, nothing existed if you couldn't see it under a microscope uh, and uh and so that was my worldview and my frame of reference. And so I joined the Rosicrucian Society, which is a society that uh, studies me metaphysics and okay. you know, mystics and things like that. And I started reading books. But anyway, I've been at that ever since. And I have written myself more than more than a couple of dozen books, many of them having to do with uh, life after death, reincarnation, the true nature of reality, the fact that I believe we're going through a transition right now, which you mentioned in your introduction, where we're going to we're transforming from a society that believes in that nothing exists except material substance matter. So you had a you had maybe uh, maybe possibly a, a near death experience or at the very least an out of body experience at the very least. And that really piqued I, your yeah. interest. Yeah, yeah, David, it, that uh, that's right. I, I wouldn't call, I don't know that it could have been either one, but I didn't have the whole 
nine yards where you go through the tunnel and you meet relatives that have passed before and you have a life review and all that stuff that typically happens or often happens with a near-death experience. It was just, I was out of my body. I was looking at, looking at it lying on the bed, not looking very healthy. And, uh, you know, golly, how can that be? You know, some people would say maybe it was a dream. It wasn't a dream. It was not like a dream. It was like, yeah. but it, it I was really, watching, I was up there. But that, that's what's really what kind of inspired this interest um, in the topic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think there is life after death? I'm pretty well convinced of it. Uh, I would say I am convinced of it. I've been studying this for a long, long time, at least 25 years, pretty seriously. And I have talked to a lot of people who have had near-death experiences. And I have talked to scientists that are studying uh, reincarnation. For example, the uh, University of Virginia has a, uh, has a department uh, of their medical school called the, the it's the Department of Perceptual Studies, and they have been studying mm. uh, children's memories of la past lives for since about the early 1960s, almost 60 years. And they have uh, accumulated something like over 2,500 cases, which they have investigated what the child was talking about, who the child said they were, what, you know, where they lived, what their family was, who pe members of their family were. And they have checked those things out. And, and more than half of them have been verified in the sense that the whatever the child was saying, there was indeed someone who had that uh, name and that lived in that place and had those relatives and so forth. And there are some very famous cases of that. But uh, yeah, that, that that's one of the things that has me convinced. And there are other things, too, if you'd like to hear about. It. Well, that's what I that was the other part of the question was I wanted to ask you um, what other evidence of life after death you're aware of. And also, I wanted to ask you, because this is something that's always been of interest to me. So part one would be what ev what other evidence are you aware of of it? And then. After that, what structure is it? You know what I mean? Is it you just, it's hard to imagine, you know, phantasmal uh, beings just kind of floating around. There must be some type of uh, societal structure or some type of organization to how things work and function. So I guess that yes. would be part two of that question. All right. Well, part one, what was part one again was, uh, what, uh, what other, other evidence, evidence? what yeah, other okay. evidences are you aware of? Well, uh, near death experiences. There are actually four different areas of actually maybe more than four different areas of proof. One would be near death experiences. Another would be, uh, recall of, uh, or r loose lucidity right before death among those who have had Alzheimer's and other kinds of damaged brain disease. Uh, and uh, also uh, the uh, fact that mediums can uh, contact people, the non-living, loved ones of the non-living. And that has been uh, tested, for example, I interviewed a, a woman named uh, Julie Bichelle, who's a PhD in in pharmacology. And of course, you know, when you're uh, a PhD in pharmacology, one of the main things you do is, is construct double blind studies to see whether a particular drug is effective or not. And you have right. to take a placebo and you have a and they don't know which and so on. And she used that those techniques to study mediums. And she has published a paper in a peer reviewed journal that the conclusion is that yes, uh, psychics, some psychics are able to uh, relate information that could have not couldn't have known any other way about uh, disincarnate loved ones of you know, that they're doing the, mm. the uh, reading for, and that, uh, uh, that that is can be done without any trickery in a double blind situation where there's no way they could have known anything about the uh, deceased individual or, 
any facts or whatever, and they're able to give the facts. That so that that's one. And then another one in the near death experiences, there are some really incredible uh, accounts. One being, and and your listeners can probably find a video on mm. YouTube, Pam Reynolds. If you put Pam Reynolds into YouTube, uh, uh, near Reynolds. death experience, I'm sure, sure it would come up. Okay. And she, for example, uh, had two aneurysms in her head, in her brain that were inoperable as long as she was alive. And the doctor, it was such a critical situation that she was going to die when one of those things burst. So they did a radical procedure where they actually shut down her body, drained the blood out of it, went, opened her skull and went in and fixed those aneurysms. They couldn't do it while there was blood flowing through them or yeah. flowing through the brain. And when that happened, she popped out of her body, uh, was able to kind of look over the shoulder of the doctor, described what he was doing, which she there was no way for her to know. She described what the nurses and the other doctors were saying and doing, which was some some of it kind of unusual. I could go into detail, but I don't want to take up too much time. And and then she went through the tunnel and she met the relatives or grandmother who'd passed away and an uncle who passed away. And she spent some time there until she her actually her uncle told her she had to go back. And she went back down the tunnel and she looked at her body on the gurney on the operating table said i don't want to go back into that because it was dead it was a cadaver but uh they did the electric thing you know they put the blood back in her body they heated it back up sure. they did the electric you know whatever they call those things and boom she was back in her body that was, so i mean how, go ahead that, that was pam reynolds or, or was Ren it pam reynolds R E Y N O L D S. Okay. Pam Reynolds. Yeah. Because I want to. I want to look her up. Yeah, you look her up. She's. Uh, it's an interview of her and her doctors uh, about this uh, about this near death experience. Okay. So Yeah, do that. So anyway, yeah, I. Uh, there, there are other. There is other evidence of uh, the fact that the brain does not create consciousness. That it's a receiver of consciousness that integrates consciousness with your body. For example, uh, Ian uh, Alexander, who, who, Evan Alexander, who was a, uh, who is a, uh, a brain surgeon, a, yes. a neurosurgeon. I'm familiar uh, with had a Had a past life experience, uh, uh, near death experience. Meditis. And he was in a coma for seven days where he, he maintains, and those who've, who've uh, examined the uh, the record in this that uh, of that uh, situation agree. Those doctors agree that he his, he was brain dead for seven days, and he had a, a an experience of being in what he called heaven, a little different than some of the other near death experiences. But uh, when he came back, uh, his whole outlook on life changed because he realized, and he will tell you now, I've seen him uh, talking about it, uh, that the brain does not create consciousness and that there is life after death. But anyway, mm. you, you, the second part of your question was, um, what is heaven like? And this is, uh, first off, we, you have to realize that one of the things that all of this research that I've done and, and all of this, this new uh, worldview of reality tells us is that we create our own reality with our beliefs and our thoughts. Right. I remember Buddha said that you are what you think. You are what you think. And there's a, in fact, there's a, a great little book, if anybody wants to read it, that was published back in, I think, 1912 by a guy named uh, James Allen called uh, It's a Man Thinketh. Oh, and yeah. It it's, a, it's a wonderful little book that really, you know, <laughs> demonstrates a, you'll be a believer that you do create your own reality after you read that book. So what we think, what we believe creates our reality in this uh, in this particular reality of physical reality that we're in 3D 
three-dimensional reality, but it takes a long time. It takes a long time for us, but we do eventually, uh, we attract, one of the basic laws of metaphysics is like attracts like. So if you believe that you are a sickly person, you're going to be a sickly person. If you believe that you are uh, destined to be successful and have a lot of money, you will eventually be successful and have a lot of money. If you believe you're a victim, you will be a victim mm -hmm. uh, after a period of time. And so our what we send out in terms of our beliefs comes back to us in terms of our reality. That is even more the case once we pass into what in effect is the, the universal mind that we all come from. We create our own reality there. And many people believe, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to go there myself to really be sure of all this, but that there are different levels of reality. Uh, one of the w ones that seems to make sense to me is uh, a, a, a guy named, uh, what was his name? Uh, well, he lived a couple of centuries ago, but he apparently was a psychic and he was able to go into these other mm. realms. And come was back. it Swinburne? I remember Swiss. reading. But, yeah, uh, Swan, uh, Swinburne. Uh, Sweden, I, Sweden, Sweden, Sweden. Swedenborg, Sweden, thank you. Swedenborg. Swedenborg I remember yeah. reading about him and he's one of the few people who really seem to put some type of structure to things so that it, it seemed to make sense in a way as if there were like a type of society or some structure to how people lived, quote unquote, in this, this nether realm, basically. Uh, there's some interesting videos about him. I'm sure there's a million books about him. I mean, who knows? You yeah. may write a book about him in the future since you're, you're, you're so well, I've used prolific. Well, I've used some of his, uh, some of some of that uh, information in some of my books, some of the information that, that he imparted, he wrote in Latin, but he has all been translated. I think he lived in the 18th century, but he, and he was from Sweden, he's Swedenborg. But uh, what he says makes sense to me based on my conversations with psychiatrists who use past life regression. They, you know, some, you may have a phobia, or some fear or whatever that that you don't quite understand where it came from. It could be coming from a past life. People who are afraid of water, for example, might have drowned in a past life. Uh, I read one uh, account where there was an alcoholic who was regressed in his past life to, and found that he was seriously mortally injured in a in a war i think it was probably the civil war or at least one that was back in the 19th century before uh we had things like ether and and uh you know it was impossible to anesthetize people right. and so back what they did then was give you alcohol you drank it you know until you got stoned and you know you didn't feel anything anymore well he was crying out for alcohol when he died because he was in such pain and so he died crying out for alcohol and pain. And in this, this life, he became an alcoholic. He couldn't get enough alcohol. And so when he was regressed to that past life, he found out why he had that craving for alcohol. It was because of that, uh, how he died mm. in that previous life. But anyway, to get back to the structure of the afterlife, basically Swedenborg says that there are seven levels and seven is an interesting number because it pops up all over the place when it comes to metaphysics and after reality and we'll talk more about it. Um, there and the top, the hot top one seven is the highest you go and that's when you essentially are returning to the source and he he equated uh, our reality here to the level in the middle. I guess it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, four or five, something like that, three or four. But anyway, it's where you got good guys and bad guys. You know, mm -hmm. you got a mixture of people. Above that, it's mostly people who are fairly um, advanced in terms of their soul evolution. Below that are people who are 
more like narcissistic or what my Christians would think of somebody who should go to hell. But it's not really hell in the sense that what Swedenborg says, and this again makes sense to me based on talking to these psychiatrists who, who, who do this uh, past life regression stuff, you go to the level where you feel comfortable. And so mm. if you're, if you're uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, you're going to go down to level number one where the bad guys live, but, he, right. but you, that's where you feel you belong and you're comfortable. And it's not like you're tortured or anything. It's not like the Christian idea of burning in hell. So it's more uh, that's of the like structure. More. As far as I see, it makes sense to me that we go where we feel we belong. We often have a soul group that we're part of, that we return to. And that soul group could be anywhere from a dozen to maybe over 30 souls, often who reincarnate, who incarnate together in families or in close uh, proximity to one another because they have missions or things to learn that they can help each other do. It could be that you're your mother in this lifetime was your wife in a previous lifetime, or uh, that your father in this lifetime was an older brother in a, another lifetime. You know, but we 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 incarnate together, not all mm. of us at once, but some of us, and we return to that group when we are when when life is done, so and that whole group is kind of evolving together. So it sounds sort of like that old expression water seeks its own level so right. if you're someone who's a narcissist or you're abusive you're going to be comfortable around other people who are narcissist or abusive and if you're someone who wants to take a different approach and say hey i want to be around people who are really artistic and creative and doing fun exciting things and you know trying to learn and evolve then that's the type of person or spirit rather that you'll encounter more of yes yes you'll be in a in a realm that and, and according to again people who uh, people who are able are able to travel out of the body into places and check them out just like swedenborg did but uh, and they tell me that there are almost an infinite number of places you can go. But but in general, that idea of you seeking the level where you mm -hmm. and going to the level, staying in the level where you feel comfortable and where you're around people that you want to be around is indeed uh, how it works. Well, that makes me definitely want to interview more and more people about the afterlife and get all these different perceptions and opinions on that. Now, let me ask you, in your view, based on what you've researched and others you've spoken to, are we able to communicate with those who have gone to the other side? And if so, you know, to what extent? Yeah, um, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, most of the time you can, and it's particularly uh, when it's a loved one who wants to contact uh, someone from the other side who has gone before them, you know, a wife wants to talk to her husband or a mother wants to talk to her son or daughter who's gone or vice versa. Uh, in fact, Julie Bachel, which I mentioned, who's done this research uh, with mediums, the reason she got interested in it, I don't know, I think I said this before, was that her mother had committed suicide and she wanted to know whether her mother's still existed her was still right. conscious and that's that's how she got into it so that's often uh, when when it's a situation like that it's usually possible for legitimate real medium to contact the person from the other side if it's for a loved one now uh that doesn't mean that we can you can just go out and contact anybody because they're not going to be interested in coming and talking to you. Right. Uh, I have just published a book though. I've got to push this it put this in because I actually sent out an email today announcing it called uh, the Metaphysical Thomas Jefferson. And one of my writers for the Oakley Press uh, got together with a uh, psychic, a, a medium who has actually, done this for books before, but in this case, they, they wanted to talk to 
Thomas Jefferson. And they spent uh, a number of different sessions, eight hours or so, talking to an entity that they believe is Thomas, was Thomas Jefferson, is Thomas Jefferson, was Thomas Jefferson. And uh, there really was, is no way, the psychic was, is not a historian, doesn't know much about the American history. And yet things that came through are just absolutely fascinating. You want to find out about Sally Hemings? Read this book, because that's one of the questions they asked. You know, that she was his uh, slave mistress. His his wife for a loved one to contact another. Some do it directly. You know, I I've interviewed people on my podcast who uh, women, for example, a couple of them who have husbands who passed that are in con pretty you know regular contact with them one on one without the intermediary the medium in the in the middle. Uh, one woman uh, was actually got to a point where she didn't want to talk to him anymore. <laughs> and he was like bothering her. The other one did. But uh, anyhow, it is possible to answer your question. Well, let me ask you, what initially caused you to question the more common materialistic view of reality that we have, for the most part, become accustomed to? where you, you were brought up to believe, I mean, you said it wasn't quite the Anglo-Saxon Protestant work ethic as, as you would think, because you said if we don't see it under a microscope, it doesn't exist. So that's pretty materialistic in, in so far as li the literal translation of it, right? Well, it is, you know. Science uh, that's taught in school still, uh, although there are many scientists now who realize that it's incorrect, particularly quantum physicists, uh, and, and remind me to tell you what Max Planck, who is a German scientist. I, I remember, I who, recognize the name. <laughs> Max Planck was the guy who uh, developed quantum theory. I mean, he died, what, 1987 or something like that. But anyhow, he said that we cannot get past consciousness, that consciousness is fundamental. And there are a number of quantum physicists who agree with him nowadays and, ha and have their theories about how all that works. And we could talk about that. But your question had to do with what got me off on this. And, and it was that out-of-body experience. And then when I started investigating it, there are all kinds of uh, things that go on that there's no way uh, that the only thing that could exist is matter. For example, uh, and and this was the science that was developed in the in the 19th century after Darwin. You know, we we scientists were able to get rid of God with Darwin and Darwin and and I can understand why they would want to do that. You know, no more witch trials and people being superstitious and uh, ideas that, uh, you know, that uh, bad uh, in the 19th, latter part of the 19th century, science became the basic premise of science is that the only thing exists that exists is material substance matter. But think about that. If that's true, then intelligence could not have existed until evolution produced a brain. Could not have because matter is not intelligent. Matter is matter and that's it. The other thing is the brain, if the brain creates consciousness, how does it do it? That's something that scientists have never figured out. They call it the hard problem. And it's the hard problem, and they haven't figured it out because the brain does not create consciousness. Think about this. The DNA molecule, the basis of life, is, you know, it's a double helix, so they can all fold up inside a cell. If you stretch that out, all mm. that double helix out, it would be over six feet long, and it is basically computer code. 
I mean, it, it's you, you've seen printouts of DNA. Sure. That's what it is. It's it's it looks like, and for that matter, is computer code because what it does it tells the cell how and when to make certain uh, proteins. That's what it does. So, if for life to have happened, there had to be some intelligent source. You don't get computer code by accident. Right. Certainly not six feet of it. Right. So. I I so agree. The... <laughs> I agree with that. You you see uh, so many incredible patterns in nature, and the more scientists probe and learn about, uh, like what you said, metaphysics and science, we see dark matter, antimatter, and gravity working in ways that don't doesn't make sense. We see new things. You know, scientists learn new things all the time about the way that physics and galaxies work. Um, yep. Let me ask you, if we reincarnate, why do you think that is? I mean, what's the 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 larger logic for it? If there's this creator, why would the creator have us come back? And is it indefinite that you just keep coming back over and over again? It Wouldn't you want it to end at some point? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question, David, and uh, and let me attempt to answer it. Uh, the what we are all on a journey, each one of us, and that is a journey of evolution. Uh, from you know, we started as one cell animals in the sea, perhaps, and that makes sense to me. And you know, we evolved into fish, and then we came out on land. Evolution has been going on since life first formed on Earth uh, 377 billion years ago, and we have been tracking with that ever since. And we come back to Earth is a school. It's the University of Earth. We come back to learn and grow and evolve. We also come back for other reasons sometimes, like to uh, Maybe we have particular something we wanted to do that we left unfinished and want to come back and do that. Or maybe we have a particular mission that we want to come back and, and, uh, and accomplish. But we usually, almost all of us, come back to learn certain things to grow. And one of the uh, things that uh, is very interesting to me is that there was a uh, an entity apparently was uh, back in the early 80s called Ra that channeled them, wrote down the, you know, transcribed the channels and published them as books. And basically Ra is supposed to be a higher, more evolved entity. Actually, he calls himself a social memory complex, which is a whole society. And he says that there are seven levels of reality, just like there are seven levels of heaven, according to Swedenborg. And the first level is matter. Just uh, think of the moon or a planet with no life on it. The second level is uh, matter plus life. That would be Earth before humans evolved. Dinosaurs and all that sort of thing, fish. Third level is where we are now. That is life plus self-aware life, life that is um, aware of itself, can fig figuratively, metaphorically step outside itself and consider its own being and, and what is the nature of reality and mm -hmm. ask these questions so like we're doing right now. That's third density. Now, third density also is characterized by the fact that these uh, sentient beings, us, feel like and believe that we're separate from one another. And that has to be because we this is the this is the density, this is the level that we develop free will, that we're able to make our own decisions. And fourth density, the next one, the one that I believe we're moving into, and by the way, if anybody wants to know a lot more about this, they can go to my website, shmartin.com, S H M A R T I T I N. Dot com on the home page is a one of the new the new book I've written which is about this transition we're going through and about what I'm talking about now 
Fourth density is where we realize that we're all connected, that we're all one, that we have one consciousness that we all share. Mm. We, we are able to, in our consciousness, consider our own thoughts. Our thoughts are our mind, and that mind is ours. And we have a subconscious mind that has all the memories going back to every incarnation we've ever had. Christians would call that the soul. But our consciousness is one consciousness, and we're able to vi- we are able to kind of sit on our shoulder and view our own thoughts because it is not the same thing as mind. And the one consciousness has all the minds together. It's called the akasha, that everything that's ever been happened, ever been done, ever been thought, is in that one mind. The Carl Jung would have called it the collective consciousness. I think he did call it the collective collective consciousness. So that's level four, where we realize that we're all one. And that's going to be a better reality to be in as we move into it. Because uh, the way you navigate that reality is you realize you're all one. So you use your talents and your gifts to to help others, to, to help. It's called service to others. Now, there are, there are people who are not going to go into a service to others reality. They're service to self people, the narcissist, narcissists, and they will incarnate on a planet where that's where they belong and where they're happy. But, okay, so that's fourth. Fifth density is uh, one where we concentrate on wisdom. And, you know, we develop technology and all that. And maybe that's where those... Uh, UFOs are coming from. You know, mm. They certainly got the technology. But anyway, uh, sixth density is where the, we put it together in uh, technology or wisdom and the uh, idea that we're all one and six and six density. And, and actually, six density is a non physical realm. Fifth is the last time we incarnate in physical reality. Six, we are out of it. And then seventh is the return to the creator. And I think that probably we there's an eighth entity, which is where we start all over again, but we start on a higher level, because I think that's how evolution works. It's more like a spiral where we, we go around and around but we, each time we get to a higher level. And I think it goes on for eternity. You know, this is the only realm where there's where time exists anyway. Uh, time is a dimension. In a linear fashion here, to, in in this reality, but uh, you know, eternity means no beginning, no end. Another part of this is why would the Creator be interested in doing all this? Why would He care? Right. And the answer is, you know, He'd be pretty lonely if it was just Him. He 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 actually experiences through us because his consciousness is our consciousness. And so he's experiencing all kinds of things, games and realities and, you know, good, bad, and indifferent and everything in between. So, and, you know, it's hard to imagine, but that's what people who are into all this think that the reason for it is that uh, the creator, I hesitate to call it God because that conjures up something outside of us because it's inside of us. The creator, the source, what we all come from is uh, experiencing all this through us. And, and it's, it's like a game of hide and seek. You know, we don't we uh, we've forgotten who we are, really, because at the core, the I am part of it is the creator himself. So there you go. Well, let me ask you, I only have about one or two more questions for you. Do you think. Well, let me rephrase that. What do you think is the, the ultimate end game as far as, uh, you know, karma, but also, you know, where things are heading in so far as like our collective consciousness? You know, if we look at politics in the US anyway, I can't speak to other countries because I only know a little bit about what's going on politically in other countries. But it seems as though in the US, it's almost it's, it seems to be about divisiveness. It's always 
one group is in power, they do their agenda, then the other group is in power, they do their agenda, and there's no effort to find common ground. There's no way to do it. So, I mean, where are we headed? What's the, the, the end game as far as here and how that's kind of connected to a larger purpose or karma? I don't know if that's yeah. really we a well put well, together question, but. I understand what you're saying there because it's uh, certainly something I've thought about a lot. And to me, the divisiveness, the pitching one group against the other is absolutely done by service to self people who want power. And that's how they get power. By telling one group they're a victim of another group, they get that group supportive of them. Of course, what it also does is keep them victims so that they will never get out of the situation that they're in. It's a total, I've even written a book about this, the, the, the case for against text. Absolutely. Because we're going to come along as we got people telling us that we're bad because, you know, we're racist, you know, and you're racist. And, oh, God, it's awful. We are all one, black, white, yellow, whatever color, green. We're all people from other planets. We're all one at the core. We have one consciousness we all share. And we've got to realize that we're all one. And we've got to realize that the way we're all going to be happy is if we work together and support each other. And I think what is going, what is happening right now is a symptom of the transition we're going through, that the raw material uh, that was channeled in the 80s talks about. Again, go to my book, shmartin.com. It's called uh, the, Our World's in Transition and You Have a Decision to Make. That's the name of the book. And we've got to realize that we're all one. And when that happens, things are going to get better. People are not going to elect someone who's pitting one group against the other. Uh, but I do think that what is happening now is symptomatic of this transition that we're going through. Young people, there are more and more. I see them all the time. I talk to them. I, I watch their videos. Are interested in spirituality and this reality that I'm talking about. And when they get a little bit older, where things, I think the situation we're in right now is like World War II, where we went from. Uh, we went from a depression. Mm -hmm. What got us out of the depression was a world war. And then the 1950s and the 1960s were like a golden age where people, if you worked in a gas station, you could buy a house. And now we're, yeah. we've gone through a, another uh, economic crisis that started in 1908. It was very slow, just like the depression was in the 1930s. And now we're in the equivalent of World War II with this, uh, with this uh, uh, um, the uh, what is it? This, the um, the COVID pandemic. That's what I heard. I was sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, due due to the, the COVID. I think it's. I'm I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Yeah. So we're we're. Yeah, we're we're in the what 80 years ago was World War II, and we're going to come out of it, and we're going to hopefully elect somebody next time who's a who is really a uniter rather than who says he is, and uh, things are going to get better. We're going to go into a new golden age, which is the fourth density that I that I've been talking about. So that's kind of where I come out on all that, David. Back well, to you. Well. Um... I really appreciate your insight. I have to start tying everything up. Do you have any final thoughts uh, b before we end our discussion? Yeah, I, I would uh, encourage people if to to check out my website because all my books there, if you, shmartin.com, S-H-M-A-R-T-I-N.com. At the top, there's a uh, menu that it says, and one of the squares says books. Click on that. And you can see them all if you want to find out about life after death, if you want to find out about this transition we're going through. 
or if you want to read one of my novels. Uh, so I encourage your listeners to do that. And, um, you know, you can also email me through that website. I, I do answer pretty quickly. And I, uh, you know, will be happy to try to answer questions that way. I've got a friend that I've developed from who got contacted me that way, who lives in France, who's read some of my books. And we, uh, we uh, exchange emails, you know, every few days. It's, he's a very interesting guy. So do that. Check out my website. And thank you so much, David, for, for having me here. I'm, I've enjoyed talking with you. Absolutely. I enjoy talking uh, with you as well. And uh, stick around for a minute or two. And for uh, those of you listening or watching this interview, thank you so much for your time. If you enjoyed this interview, please give it a like and consider subscribing. Every little bit helps. If you would like to apply to be a guest or submit a business or marketing related question for one of our listener question episodes, feel free to go to dms.blue slash podcast guest. And thanks again, everyone. Uh, have a great day and take care. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.